It's a lovely fall day in Louisville, Kentucky. And I'm Milton Metz from WHAS, your host this week and tonight especially on the interview program Bywords of KET. My guest tonight, whom I'd like you to meet, is a triple threat man. He's a, a writer, he's a composer, and he's a recording artist, Turley Richards. Hi, it's who, nice to be here. Thank you, Turley, <laughs> who, uh, who does it all as far as music is concerned. He's kind of a renaissance man with music blues, rhythm, western, you name it, and he probably has sung it or has composed it. <laughs> you know, I forget who said it. I always forget who makes these great statements, Turley, but uh, as a wise man has said, you know, let someone else write the laws of the country. Let me write the songs that people sing. Mm. And I think that's the word of the poet and the songwriter from time immemorial. It Apparently sounds, you've chosen that it way. It sounds so good. Why don't you claim that? <laughs> Why don't you I don't, tell everybody you did it? <laughs> I don't think I can get away with it. Uh, uh, Neil right. Diamond writes, you know, let, let right. me sing the songs, and it's not an original statement, but I think ever since man scratched his way out of the cave in the, in the prehistoric times, he's hummed or sung or, or done something in a, in a, to a, enlighten man's souls. I don't know, writers are really funny. I, I, I truly believe a lot of us like to try to act like we're so artistic that it totally came out of us, but really, I think every song that we write is symbolic to something that's happening or has happened, or maybe is going to happen. Yeah, I think the creative process is very interesting. Now, when you sit down with your guitar, obviously you don't write with a pencil, but you you use some kind of creative uh, force. And this is something they always ask people, like Richard Rogers or mm -hmm. Backrack or uh, Neil Sadaka, and everybody has a different answer. How? Where do the wellsprings of creativity come from? I wish I really knew. You know, when I, when I think about those, those what I call mechanical writers who write such great songs, that they, you know, they have a, a set time every day to sit down and write, and they, they work at their pianos or their guitars or whatever, and, and they write their songs. With me, it's like I can write one song one week, go six weeks without writing a song, then write 12 songs in one week. And what I do is I sit down with the guitar, and I just start playing. I just start nothing particular maybe sing somebody else's song and, and try to get in a mood and then something takes over and within an hour, within an hour, I have a song written. And it's, uh, I sometimes, I can't claim that there's something inside that writes it because sometimes I go a month before I even know what the song means. I, it's just there. You would, know? You, uh, would you sing the song that most recently has swept a rather large wave of popularity sure. regionally and nationally and then perhaps tell us how it evolved and and what it says for you. Okay, now this song, this particular song, I didn't write, Milton. A lot of people think I did. They thought I had written it. What happened is that my writing is so, I hate to use the terminology non-commercial because I think all songs can be hits once an artist is a hit. You know, and that's, that's the big problem with records. But you have to get that first record that, that seems to have the pulse beat of everybody. And uh, for some reason, most of the songs I write probably say too much. You know, if, I, if you will, you know, I, I have a lot of message songs. So I went out looking for tunes, and a guy named Tom Snow wrote the melody, and a girl named Nan O'Byrne wrote the words. And the first day I heard this, I just flipped out, and I said, I don't know if the song fits me, but I think the song's a hit. And fortunately for me, it was. I'll just do a little bit of it for you. It sounds a whole lot better with, with band, of course. <laughs>
Oh, it's lovely, yeah. Turley. Uh, that's it's so lovely uh, out here, it's easy to sing. <laughs> well, <laughs> I hope the wind didn't uh, overpower the microphone. There's an elemental truth to that statement. That, sure. I suppose that appealed to you, too. Uh, not only the melody, but the lyrics say something. Oh, absolutely, you know. Which you can't say about all lyrics today. That's for sure. It seems like my, my somebody was like it really happened when uh, my baby, my little boy came, which was three years ago. And my life changed a whole lot of ways. And, you know, it was the first time I really experienced what I call, even though I love my parents and love my wife and all those things, it was a, a whole different love that I experienced. That, that I was so scared to have a boy, you know, being a, growing up as a jock myself, a basketball and, and kind of a sports guy and a real macho type guy. I was really concerned about having a boy. Was as a blind person, was I going to be able to teach him the things he should know and all that? And and once he got there, and once we were started communicating, it's it's so much. I mean, it's just unbelievable. It's uh, it's the greatest love I've ever had in my life. Truly, you've gone through so many stages, experiences in your young life. I feel like Jonathan uh, Siegel. I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've gone through. I mean, you were on a, a religious. Right. Kid for a while? Well, I was actually what I was, I was more of a radical uh, Jesus person. You know, I went, to the, I went to the proselytizing and everybody went through. I still believe very much. I have a very, you know, strong belief. Uh, the biggest part of my belief, I guess, is also believing that I'm not a perfect person and, and that I do have problems. And I think that's what one needs to do. They have to identify those problems and try to work on them. And uh, just things have changed. You know, I, I started back in the late 50s, I'm 39 now, and I started in the late 50s messing around with rock and roll, mostly R&B and, and black church music. Then I went into five years of jazz, <laughs> and 65 I realized, you know, jazz singers were not making any money, so then I went into, uh, back into the R&B music trying to make it, and, and in 1968 I told I was, they told me I was going blind. And the strangest thing, I evolved into playing a guitar again. I had laid the guitar down for six or seven years and picked it up got an acoustic guitar and started doing folkish type music and was with Warner Brothers and became more of a solo act, I guess more of an individual act then. And then in 71, I, I, I was really doing well, real, real well. Had a couple of hit records, had my album selling real well, making lots of money. And I wasn't handling Gone Blind, mostly because people around me were so sad about it. And they, can, they kept me sad, you know, it was that tone of voice Oh, Turley, you know, boy, it must be tough. And, you know, and it was tough as long as people around me acted that way. And when I, uh, that's when I came down here. It's when I first met you. I, I came to Louisville in 1972 to get away from everybody in New York. And I hid away in a little club called 100, you know, the, down on Washington right, Street. Right. And I did your all show and kind of semi-retired while I was in Louisville. I quit trying to record for about five years. And uh, I really found myself here in Louisville. And... Uh, of course, I was always there. I guess I just didn't want to look and see what I was. Turley, though, <laughs> it is natural to say, to look heavenward and say, why me? Why me, Lord, you know? And it, it's difficult not to be bitter, isn't it? Well, no, I was at first. Obviously, the first thing, you know, uh, I felt like an eagle that had his wings clipped because I, I was a good athlete. I, I was a really good pool shark. I, I did things that were lots of fun, and I, and I had to stop doing that. But no, I, I tell you, Milton, uh, I don't have any bitterness about it all. As a matter of fact, I don't know if I'd want to see again if I, if I had to change the person that blindness brought me. Uh, the person that was sighted, I didn't like. And I, don't, I can't sit here and tell you what I didn't like about him, but I know I like the new person. You mean you're much different from what you oh, were? Yeah, sensitivity is just incredible. My, my feelings for other people have changed, and uh, I'm, I'm learning people from the inside to the outside as opposed to the outside to the inside. I, 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 you, know, you know how you grow up, man. You grow up to look at the, mo the prettiest girl, you yeah, the, drive the nicest car. Right. Well, I've met so many people now that on the surface, in our, in our society, would be considered ugly, but the most beautiful people in the world inside. And if I, if I was able to see, I probably wouldn't talk to that person because I was trained the other way, you know. I mean, I, I just wouldn't look at them. You know, I'd look at them and say, oh, there goes a dog, and, and then go on to trying to find me a good-looking lady. And I've met so many people that are just, just fantastic. You have I've different judging criteria when you can't see. It would probably, in a way, be helpful. We, they say we're a materialistic society. We make superficial judgments. Absolutely. You know, on, 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 the, on the trappings of a person, how much chrome is on his car. Exactly. How much oh, is all in his clothing and so forth. And the inner person sometimes <clears throat> escapes our notice. 
They don't escape me anymore because, you know, all I've got is a voice and vibes. I really believe in body aura because I've, I've been studying it and I'm really learning. I can read people. I can tell when they're not looking at me when they're talking to me. I can feel their defenses go up. And as a matter of fact, there's parts of it I wish I didn't have because I intimidate the hell out of people. I, I did when I was sighted anyway because I was a big guy, <laughs> you know, did it. But now that I'm a big guy who's blind, it's, you know, it's like a double thing. Or, or I, I think blind people do make some people very uneasy, Turley. Yeah, I think most of them they'll make, you know, I'm not trying to pick on blind people now, but I have, I got to tell you, 1% of the blind people that I've met is all I like. I don't like most of them because they're, they're, they are what you said, why me, Lord, and bitter, and nervous acting, they're sliding all over the place, they're real rigid, and, and you have a tendency of feeling sorry for them because when I was sighted, I felt sorry for blind people. As a matter of fact, the hardest part about going blind was me looking at that image of what a blind person was. I didn't want to look like it. I thought I was going to be pitiful and real pathetic and everybody was going to have to do this for me, do that for me. And fortunately for me, being sighted before, you know, I brought along my agility. I'm very, you know, agile. And uh, after I went blind, I studied judo and became a brown belt in judo and I, I worked more on my agility. I think more blind people should work on that. And more blind people should work on what I call my 10 self-effacing blind jokes to make the sighted world comfortable. <laughs> could you care to tell me one of these oh. one of these ten self-effacing blind jokes? Oh, they could be anything like to a girl, you know, like, hey, how would you like a blind date for tonight? Or, oh. You know, just anything that, uh, there's not, I don't have a set pattern, it's just whatever happens to happen at the time. Incidentally, speaking of Or I would be girls. looking at you better except the sun's bothering me, you know, you know, silly things, you know. Groaners are the best. <laughs> I have noticed, speaking of girls, that, uh, you seem to uh, attract a very handsome class of female personage to your to your side from time to time over the years. Yeah, my wife right now is a beautiful girl. My ex-wife was beautiful. She was a high fashion model. Patty could be a model if she wanted. And uh, I guess I just look at it saying blind is kind. You know, it's still a little bit from Ali there, you know. <laughs> it seems to, uh, I don't know what it is. It must be my fagginess. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's your overwhelming personality. Yes, that's what it is. I have uh, attended a number of your nightclub and concert performances, and as you mentioned, you're kind enough to be on some programs we've done in Louisville. But what I like so much about your approach to music is the variety that you bring to it. For instance, your jazz is just wonderful to listen to. Then you go into a rock or some mm -hmm. country uh, and western piece, which makes for a very interesting mix on, a, on an evening's program. Yeah, you know, I, my versatility is killing me in the record business. Uh, it's great for live performing. The record business needs something that's real pigeonholed, and uh, once I get successful, then my versatility will be great for me on records, because then there's a longevity involved. But I really enjoy playing the variety, because I have a theory that the Beatles, who sold more records than anybody, let's say they would sell three million records at one time, and the world's population is gigantic, so their three million is really less than a, even less than a minute percent. And they, so I've I always looked at it, when I go into a club, if I satisfied one out of every hundred people, I, I've really turned them on. So what I try to do is do enough music, because in that club, no matter what, there's gonna be people from age 21 to 50, and there's gonna be a variety of music enjoyed, and I think it's really sad that most entertainers today are so one-dimensional and they, they just play what they want to play. And if you don't like it, go somewhere else. And so I really try to get a variety because that way you're going to please enough people. Why is the record business such a killer, Turley? Well, an old expression is the radio has us by the short hairs. <laughs> and the reason I say that is because if no matter, like you can go out, like my record deal with Atlantic Records was a, almost a $2 million record deal. And, Everybody was excited, boy, and it's all this is going to happen. Mick Fleetwood of Fleetwood Max involved with Turley, and boy, the, the career is made. Not true. No matter how good of an album you cut, no matter what, you still have to get radio to play it. If radio doesn't play it, you don't have a max, mass acceptance. So that's part of it being tough. There's a lot of crazy people in our business, and I'm talking about executives, that throw money away, getting back to my deal. Almost a $2 million deal. You know, the president of the company never saw me. Didn't know whether I was white, black, or green. Didn't know really what I sounded like except on three songs. Didn't know what I did live, and yet they put that kind of money out. Wow. So it's, there's crazy money being thrown away. Mick Fleetwood, their group, Fleetwood Mac, spending a million dollars on an album. That's really sad. With a million dollars, I could cut 10 albums. 
So what I look at is those kind of people are taking nine albums out of the hands of people who could be, you know, recording. Turley, what makes cutting an album or a record session uh, so expensive? Our, their musician salary and studio rental, but the astronomical sums you mentioned, where do they go to? Well, I'll tell you what, as a producer, which I am now as a record producer, and I've produced people, people like me who want the state of the arts in the studio causes a studio owner to go out and buy more and more expensive equipment, and he's got to charge more per hour. Like, I end up paying some, sometimes between $170 and $250 an hour, $250 an hour for studio time. Right. Uh, musicians cost you a ton of money. You got your flights to wherever you're going to do it at. It should not cost what it does. I'll tell you, the biggest cost is non-planning. They don't plan it. Most producers do not care about the artist's money, and every penny you spend is the artist's money. So to me, you need to plan it out. There should be no surprises in the studio, unless they're pleasant. Turley, every once in a while, there's an enormous hit that comes out. It sells hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of records. Mm -hmm. And you talk to the artists involved, and they said, oh, yes, we had come to the end of the session, and we had room for one more song. And somebody said, well, gee, we don't have anything. And they said, well, let's try this old number. <laughs> and uh, then we knocked it out in 15 minutes, and lo and behold, it was the hit of the whole album. Now, is that a Hollywood story? Do those things actually happen? It happens. It's, you know, it's, <laughs> it's so funny. I wish that I had the knack of being able to tell somebody what a hit song was because I'd quit singing and producing and just work for all the labels saying, now this is a hit and that's a hit and then charge them. You just don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what the public's going to accept. I mean, how do you know when the public buys songs like Purple People Eater back in those times? You, right. you don't know what, you know, what's going to happen. There, there's been a lot of studying done recently on cycles, frequency, what it does to the mind. There's a synthesizer called a sequencer, and what it does, you feed in a note, and then you, you play it on the sequencer, and it causes a note just to keep repeating over and over and over. So like uh, Donna Summer's record, in the background, all you could hear was this all the way through a song. Even though you didn't hear it real well, it was there. And supposedly it does something to the mind. The mind locks into that repetitiveness, you know. And it's, I mean, there's things like that being done now, studies on what cycles do to minds, right. you know. So they get at you through the mind and you don't even know it's being worked. Yeah, I can't get into that stuff. I just think, I still say, and I may go down never being a, a giant success as far as the public, uh, the mass is concerned. I'm a success as far as I'm concerned because I'm a happy man. Um, but indeed. the success, I, I don't think I can ever do it. I still believe if you cut good songs and, still, and, and work at it, it's got to come out somewhere. Would you, uh, on this lovely fall day outside here in Louisville, do a little jazz or blues number? Sure. Which one, jazz or blues? Either <clears throat> one. Want some jazz? Yes, that'd be nice. <clears throat> Let's see here. Uh, a pretty song? Yes. Suitable to the day. Spring this year Has really got me feeling like a horse that never left the post. Spring arrived on time, only what became of you, dear. Spring can really hang you up alone. Morning's kiss Wakes trees and flowers And to them I'd like to drink a toast I walk through the park Just to kill the long
as a bow oh, no around the new year now it's April and love is just a ghost spring I did that a little up instead of a ballad. <laughs> that was... Isn't that a great song? Whose song is that? You know, I, I keep telling myself I'm going to find out who it is. It's, a, uh, it's two people out of New York. Last name of one of them was Wolf, but I can't remember their names. I love that. You know, it's so poignant. The oh, yeah. Spring is here, but where are you? you know? Exactly, yeah. That's back in the... That was a, like a early 50s or late 40s type song. You're the kind of a fellow my wife would like to keep around. She thinks that in the old days when they had court musicians, oh, the yeah. heck with being a powerful king, if you just had your own little <laughs> musician to follow you around, and when you were in a funk, Turley, to ask him to play a nice little ballad or a to bring you up tempo up. song. I don't know what keeps me up all the time. I just, I'm always up. I just. Uh... How do you keep in shape? You look very fit. You look like you could go a, a couple of quarters. In a basketball game? Well, I could probably box uh, Ali right now. But, uh, <laughs> That's unfair. <laughs> I love yeah. him. He's my favorite. Uh, I run, I, well, I do a lot of running. I run like 50 or 60 miles a week. Uh, I work out at Nautilus sometimes. I'm about 200 pounds and six, three and a half, so I'm you know, in pretty good condition. How do you manage the running? Well, you know, when I first started, uh, it gets back to the old problems and solutions and things. When I first started, I ran with people. And the sight of people just were not showing up. I was too enthused about running every day, and I wouldn't get enough people to run with me. So I sit down and try to figure out what's the solution, because I feel like I'm in jail. And I went out and bought a treadmill. Uh -huh. And it's a real nice treadmill. It's a, it's a slanted one. It's on a 6% grade. I even put wood under it sometimes to make it steeper. And I run 60 to 75 minutes a day, and I take my, which you should know about this, you read for the blind, you know, the books for the blind on yeah. the record and tapes. And I have a shelf beside my treadmill with the tape machine and the record machine. I put them up there, and, and I read while I run. I call it R&R. Do you ever run off the treadmill into the wall? No. I never thought about it. I might try that. I might, you know. <laughs> no, it's got rails on it. I see. You know, and I, uh, I run about a seven-minute mile when I'm, when I'm on the treadmill. And I try to run like six or seven of them at a time, you know. Terry, you're a very expressive person in your opinions and in your friendships. What kind of person appeals to you the most? Honesty is the first. Um, I really like people who, that I can feel like they, they care for themselves. Uh, I unfortunately have one problem. Uh, I have no room in my life for a weakness. I don't like people's weaknesses, especially if it's them causing it. Really? I have problems with that because I think there's nothing that can't be defeated. I think defeating blindness was a very difficult thing, but it's, now that it's past me, it seems like a very simple thing. But uh, I like honesty. I like people that are open, talk to you, not afraid to say what they want to say. And um, beyond that, I just I, I don't think I have room for anybody else. How do you indulge yourself? Mm, I guess with uh, looking around for, you know, is that what you're talking about exactly? Well, I look uh, around. Do for... you have any expensive indulgences oh, that type or of habits? Thing. Yes. How do you baby yourself uh, or Laura, your wife? Exercise equipment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I get these gadgets. I'm a great gadget person. I, I, get, a, I get in a bad mood and uh, get uh, down about anything at all. I run out and buy a little exercise gadget. I got more gadgets in a closet, and none of them work. You know, it's just <laughs> Now, I, I don't know. How do I indulge myself? My children, I guess. That's, that's what makes me. Oh, I have a new baby girl, by the way. Five weeks old. Her name is Amber. So and I tell myself, my kids, I don't have any uh, extravagant uh, You need a hit that. album, a hit record. Do buy. I need one? Well, it, it would be welcome. Yeah, it would be nice. I, 
I don't want to ever be a big star. I never want my time taken away from me. It's quite a Turley Richards cult, though. Yeah, it's it's built over. I guess when you're as old as I am and you've been saying it, see if you don't pick up a few over <laughs> through the years, you know, if, if I just pick up 300 every year, you know, I've done pretty well, you know. Turley, we're down to about a minute and a half. I hate to see you standing around not using that <laughs> guitar. It seems oh. to be a waste. Sure. You know, uh, at, uh, the one thing we haven't heard today is a bluesy number, something New Orleans, oh. Bayou. Oh, Delta Blues? Yeah. yeah. That's what I grew up on. That's easy for me. We'll go off on that. Okay. It's been a pleasure being here. Oh, sometimes, ooh, baby, sometimes I feel so low down. Oh, yes, I do. I said, sometimes, baby, all I said, sometimes I feel so low down. Shirley Richards, songwriter. Thank you.